lifting up Jesus and opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching Morial TV. We explain this at greater length on our teaching, The Reign of Asa. Let's understand what the issue was. There was a kind of a spiritual degeneration in his overall life, towards the end of his life. There was a kind of almost belligerence. We're not suggesting he was not in the end saved. We're simply saying that something happened to him in old age where his behavior could become quite carnal. A warning to the rest of us. Nonetheless, <clears throat> the problem was not that he went to a physician. The problem is he went to a physician instead of going to the Lord. Medical science and faith are not mutually exclusive. There's nothing that indicates Luke did not continue to practice medicine. Implicitly, he did in the New Testament. Jesus used the example of the Good Samaritan, <clears throat> rendering first responder medical assistance to the victim of a mugging on the road between Jerusalem and Jericho, as an example of what believers should be like. The scripture never condemns medical science at all. What it does condemn is going to the disciplines of the world without going to the Lord first. Never take an aspirin without praying. Whenever we make use of the world's health system, the world's financial system, the world's legal system, etc., always go to the Lord first. We need his wisdom and guidance in doing it. What lawyer, what physician, what accountant? Should I do this? Should I do that? Never trust in secular disciplines. Trust in the Lord and let him guide us as we deal with these secular disciplines of the world. Okay. The problem is when people trust in medical science instead of in the Lord. The problem is when people trust in wealth instead of in the Lord. The problem is when people trust in the world's judicial system for justice instead of trusting in the Lord. That's not to say the Lord cannot make use of courts. It's not to say the Lord cannot make use of physicians or cannot make use of uh, investment advisors. None of that. But our faith and our trust must be in him, not in professionals, not even in Christian professionals. We must be led by him in all things. The two are not mutually exclusive. We're told that the Lord initiated human government in both Testaments. However, we don't look to human government for proper government. Not until the government is on his shoulders will there be proper government in the millennial reign of Christ. This world is too corrupt. Medical science is no different. Can God use it? Yes. Does God use it? Yes. But ultimately, it's going to fail. It can't give somebody eternal life. Only Jesus can. And even when we make use of it, our first medication is prayer. Our first physician is the Lord himself. Then we go to the other. Thank you so much for your question. My name is Jacob Prash.
Hello, dear friends, and greetings in Jesus. Much has been said in recent years about the subject of revival. By any barometer of church history, by any reasonable barometer, Protestantism is a declining faith in the developed world. It's declining. It's declining spiritually. It's declining morally and ethically. It's declining numerically. It is a faith in the developed world in decline. Most of Europe is post-Christian and neo-pagan. Great Britain, countries such as Scandinavian nations, Holland, Germany, Switzerland, the countries that had Protestantism, where Protestantism and the Reformation began, are essentially post-Christian. The United Kingdom has a less than 10% church attendance. Areas of Scotland are virtually pagan. So is much of the north of England particularly. Germany, it's even worse. Church attendance is about 2%, inclusive of all Catholics and Protestants. The real growth in much of Western Europe is in Eastern religions, especially Islam, including its radical varieties, and the growth of cults, to a degree Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, but particularly a resurrection of ancient Anglo-Saxon, Wicca, paganism, and various other things expressing themselves under the broad title of what we call the New Age Movement, together with things as such as Hinduism directly imported from the Orient. It is post-Christian neo-pagan. The United States is running on its inertia of its Christian past. Countries like Australia and New Zealand are following suit. Protestantism is declining. It's declining theologically, of course. This began with the advent of higher criticism and liberal theology, which came out of Tübingen, Germany, and took over such institutions as the divinity schools of Yale and Princeton in America and Harvard and Oxford, Harvard in America and Oxford and Cambridge in Great Britain. Institutions that once had, again, an evangelical Protestant heritage. But that is essentially gone. We are in a post-Christian academic environment. In fact, a neo-pagan one. Even higher criticism has declined. What are we coming to? We have a new spirituality based on eclecticism, based on interfaith, which becomes partners with the multiculturalism. In this environment, evangelicals have sought ways to revive the decline of the church. Many of the people who tried these ways were sincere in their motive. They desired to stop the decline. The decline, however, has not only been theological, the decline has been moral and ethical. While people rolled on the floor and laughed at a church in London, England, called Holy Trinity Brompton, saying God was doing something new, and there was a move of the spirit imported from Toronto, Canada, which saw people in drunken hysterics and even animal imitations. On the other side of the Thames River, in Southwark Cathedral, a place where Christians were once arrested and martyred under the reign of Queen Mary in the aftermath of the Reformation, homosexuals and lesbian Anglican clergy, dressed in vestments and clerical garb, were having a gay and lesbian service in front of national TV cameras during the supposed move of God. Widespread ordination of homosexuals is particularly acute among Methodists and more so among Reformed and Presbyterian churches in Britain, and this is extended into the USA. The Church of England, of course, and Anglicanism being at the forefront of this decline in moral standards. It is declining ethically and morally as well as theologically. And it is declining numerically. It's interesting to see that where there are indeed evangelical moves of God, large moves of God, as you'd see, for instance, in the Philippines, or as you'd see in Latin America, what happened in the Reformation during the 16th century is now transpiring in Latin America. In Guatemala, 10% of the people left the Roman Catholic Church in 10 years' time and became evangelical, mainly Pentecostal. The growth of evangelical Baptist and Pentecostal groups has been astounding. Brazil may have us much as a close to 30% evangelical population within the next 10 years. It had been the largest Roman Catholic country in the world with a 98% Roman Catholic population as recently as the 1970s. It's declining and declining rapidly with the explosive growth of evangelicism. You only find the ecumenical movement, this rapprochement between Roman Catholicism and Protestantism in the countries where the church is declining, where Protestantism is dying. The only place you'll find the ecumenical input in Latin America or the Philippines is where it's imported from the United States or from Europe. 
indigenously, these people say, we've come out of Rome. This is exactly what happened in the Reformation in the 16th century. It's for this reason that four times Pope John Paul II has denounced evangelical Christians. He did it in Rome, he did it in Mexico City, he did it in Santo Domingo, and he did it in La Paz, Bolivia, even referring to evangelical missionaries as rapacious wolves. While he's calling evangelicals rapacious wolves, you have other evangelical leaders such as Chuck Colson and Nicky Gumbel in Great Britain applauding him as a Christian, despite the fact of his willingness to take anointings from Hindu high priestesses and to kiss books such as the Koran, which says God has no son. Again, we are seeing a post-Christian, neo-pagan Western world. Many people are just not attending any church. Even many evangelicals will just now meet in homes or not meet anywhere, rather than become part of denominational or institutional Christianity in any sense. People want to stop the decline. Many things have been attempted to stop this decline and to reverse these trends. Unfortunately, the things people try lack a biblical premise in most cases, and in the long term they don't work. Many of these ideas were formulated at theological seminary in California called Fuller, where you had the influences of the late John Wimber and C. Peter Wagner. The idea was if you could see what was happening in Latin America and just bring the model or the same program to the United States or to Europe, you'd get the same results. Get the program right and you'll get the results. A programmatic approach to missions. Uh, much the same as you'd say if you get the right software package for your computer, your computer will do what you want it to. Just get the right programming. This has led to an outburst of an emphasis on marketing and marketing psychology in order to make churches grow. And it has ignited a chain of gimmicks. But in fact, in the long term, it has singularly and categorically failed to bring the promised revival or anything resembling it. Biblical factors such as the sovereignty of God or the need for repentance in the church have been factored out of the equation in favor of just getting the right approach or the right program. The incipient influence of this came from positive thinking guru Norman Vincent Peale, a 33rd degree Freemason, who was the mentor of Robert Schuller at the Crystal Cathedral in California. Schuller's disciples, in turn, include Bill Hybels of Willow Creek Church in Chicago and Rick Warren, author of The Purpose Driven Church, The Purpose Driven Life, the latest attempt to try to revive the decline of the church. Again, an entire chain of programs of moves of God, as they were labeled, were undertaken to try to make churches grow. Admittedly, some of these things were pioneered by con artists, financial con men, simply perverting scriptures out of context in order to line their own pockets. Many of these things were plainly not biblical. The fruit of the Spirit was self-control, we're told in the New Testament, ekrete being the Greek word. When people are out of control, plainly God is not in control. Much the same as if an alcoholic becomes a Christian and he goes into a, a pub or a bar and begins drinking, he's not in control of himself. Therefore, God is not in control of him. So when someone is on the floor in drunken hysterics, God's not in control of them. It's quite simple. The only time you saw animal imitations in the Bible is when the mind of a beast was given to Nebuchadnezzar. It was a judgment. Yet in a desperate attempt to see Protestantism revived and to see revival come, the church revived, people followed these things. Much of it, again, was pioneered from California. The late John Wimber came along with the idea of power evangelism, saying that signs and wonders were the key to revival. Now, I myself, being a moderate Pentecostal, a moderate charismatic, am very concerned about a biblical understanding of gifts of the Spirit. I am not a cessationist. I do not believe that the proposition that the gifts of the Spirit ended with the apostles is tenable or plausible. It is certainly not scriptural. Having said that, are signs and wonders the key to belief? Well, the New Testament plainly says no. Faith cometh not by seeing anything, but by hearing and hearing the word of God. Jesus himself plainly said, for which one of these signs do you stone me? In John chapters 9 and 10. Jesus himself repeatedly said they would not believe despite the signs they saw in John chapter 12. Biblically, signs and wonders have never been the key. Biblically, it's these signs follow. Jesus never had a miracle crusade, and he never had a healing crusade. He had miracles and healings, but never a crusade. He had a repentance crusade. Biblically, these signs follow. 
He warned that many would come to him in the last days, saying, Lord, didn't we do signs in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? And Matthew chapter 7, verse 22, and Jesus is going to say, I never even knew you. Didn't deny that they did the signs, but these things don't bring revival or prove anything about anyone except Jesus himself. And so it goes on. Was Mr. Wimber correct? Well, we see, indeed, he was not. He certainly was not. When he came to Great Britain with the Kansas City prophets, Paul came, Mike Jones, who was found in, uh, Bob Jones, who was found in immorality, and Mike Bickle, who prophesied that revival was going to come to Great Britain in October of 1990 and rapidly spread out across Europe into Germany. Since that time, more mosques have been built in England than churches. Now, that was 14 years ago. They were dead wrong. The prophet uh, Moses tells us that those who predict things in God's name that failed to happen are false prophets and we're commanded to avoid them. Yet we've had predictions of revival in Zimbabwe by Cindy Jacobs. The diametric opposite happened. We have people following people like Rick Joyner in the United States. Rick Joyner has written a book called The Harvest where he warned that there would be a triumph of communism. Six months later, the Berlin Wall came down and no revival came. If you want to know what's going to happen, look at the prophecies of Rick Joyner and figure on the diametric opposite. Yet people will still follow these people even though the Bible says they are false prophets because they prophesied falsely in God's name. People would say we need grace. And actually Mike Bickle said on a video, you can be part right and part wrong. Wimber said you can be part right and part wrong. Well, you know, before I was a Christian, there was a witch who read my tarot cards near New York City. She was part right and part wrong. No one would have a problem saying that Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormons, was a false prophet. He predicted things that didn't happen. That Brigham Young, another founder of the Mormons, predicted things that didn't happen, and he's a false prophet. So did Charles Tazzy Russell. We have no problem calling them false prophets. But an unjust balance is an abomination to the Lord by the same standard. So were Mike Bickle. So was Paul Kane. So was Rick Joyner and Cindy Jacobs. So was Gerald Coates. These people, led by Benny Hinn, who also made predictions of revival in New Zealand, where I am at the moment, never came to pass. People begin following prophets, giving promising prospects of a great awakening that never seems to arrive. This was, of course, accompanied by the Signs and Wonders movement. Signs and Wonders in Hebrew are called Nesim Veniflaot. I certainly believe in them, understood biblically. But Jesus said, a wicked and an adulterous generation seeks a sign. When we see people flocking to stadiums for this, <laughs> people blowing on them and falling over, this is again what Jesus warned about, a wicked and an adulterous generation seeking a sign by prophets who prophesy falsely, false prophets who Jesus would warn would come in the last days. But still no revival comes. People can fall down all they want. The falling down phenomenon today bears no resemblance to the biblical slain in the spirit, which was a once in a lifetime life-changing experience. Moreover, in the Bible, people always fell forward on their faces and worshiped to God what we call in Hebrew, hishtachavot. The only place they ever fell backward in the Bible was when they came to arrest Jesus, and it was a judgment in the Garden of Gethsemane. Yet these people are falling the wrong way. But there's no revival from any of this nonsense. Never has been, and there won't be. The promises of Rodney Howard Brown came to nothing. The promises of the Kansas City prophets came to nothing. After Kansas City, it was the Laughing and Drunken Revival in Toronto, Canada, followed by its American counterpart from Pensacola, Florida. The pastor there, John Kilpatrick, condemned the major Christian writer for criticizing it as a counterfeit revival and said in three months God would bring him down. Instead, three months later, John Kilpatrick himself fell off a roof and was wheeled out in a wheelchair. The only one God brought down was him. Brownsville, Pensacola Church split, and no revival has come there any more than it did to the Airport Vineyard Church in Toronto, Canada. John Arnott was wrong. There was no revival in Toronto, no revival in Pensacola, no revival in New Zealand, Britain, or anywhere. No revival has come. The cults continue to grow. Eastern religion continues to grow. Immorality continues to expand. Pornography continues to pollute the airwaves at an accentuated pace. Militant homosexuality becomes more aggressive by the day, but no revival comes. After that, it was the promise keepers. 
again, seven promises, at least two of which were not even biblical, based on a compromised approach to Christianity. One of its leaders, James Ryle, said the Beatles were God's prophets. Now, I've witnessed the two of the Beatles. Both of them are now dead. I can promise you the Beatles were new age. They were not God's prophets. They distributed a book called The Masculine Journey, containing new age mas uh, phallic symbolism, male phallic symbolism, by Robert Hicks, formerly of Dallas Seminary, saying that Jesus was tempted in all manner that we are, and he was tempted to have sex with other men. Thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of copies of this book was distributed. We have to get the men to be the spiritual heads of the family. And then we'll see a move of God, a revival. In one stadium alone, in Colorado, perhaps 50,000 copies of this book are said to have been distributed. It had the seal of promise keepers on it, men of integrity. When challenged, they issued an eight and a half page defense and then finally withdrew it because they were losing members because of it. But no revival came from promise keepers. And in fact, it's found that Mr. McCartney was found to have been a coach of a football team a short time previously, and the reputation of its players, and everything from getting young women pregnant to brawling was absolutely astounding. He was no leader of men himself. He himself had been an alcoholic and not a Christian a very long time. Those joining Promise Keepers may have had good intentions, but to use male phallic symbolism and say Jesus wanted to have sex with other men, what does this have to do with revival? It has nothing to do with revival. And so from Kansas City to Toronto to Pensacola to Promise Keepers, the next was gold teeth and gold dust. However, dental opinion said that those were mercury amalgam fillings and silver fillings. One woman in Jerusalem called Ruth Heflin was claiming the dust was falling from the sky and was putting live photos on the internet. A magazine had the gold dust analyzed chemically and found out it was plastic stationary glitter you would buy in a shop for decorating posters. Open charlatanism, open frauds. She has since died. But before she died, she gave a prophecy that Jesus Christ would appear at a meeting of her friend Benny Hinn. Jesus hasn't shown up yet, and the poster glitter is not gold. Others were claiming to have palm on their hands. This goes back to the 1920s, this palm oil. A.A. A. Allen, who died drunk and in disgrace, was the father of the oil on the hands, came with the gold dust. Well, the gold dust might have come, but it wasn't real, and no revival came. After that, it was Alpha Courses. Alpha Courses. Jesus said, I will send you forth, and he tells us not to make converts, but make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Find believers' baptism in an Alpha Course, you won't. In fact, the Bible tells us if an angel of God comes with another gospel, don't believe it. Don't believe it. Does the blood of Christ cleanse from all sin, or do you atone in purgatory for your own? That's the question. Is salvation by grace through faith? Does it come about through the new birth, or does it come about through an ex opere operato ritual called the sacrament? It's a different gospel. Yet Alpha tells people to stay in the Roman church, to practice transubstantiation, to pray to the dead, to partake of the very things the founders of Protestantism, themselves Roman Catholic clergy, were martyred for, for refusing to sanction or partake in. No revival came from Alpha. The impact of Alpha has been so great that in Great Britain, the Church of England that gives us Alpha loses a thousand people a week. The new Archbishop of Canterbury is a man who's ordained homosexuals. The oldest enemies of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the British Isles were the Druids. Now the Archbishop Druid God, son of Anius. Quite a situation. No revival has come from Alpha. Again, since Alpha courses, more mosques have been built in Britain than churches. After Alpha, the next gimmick became The God Chasers, written by someone called Tommy Tenney a man whose background is not Trinitarian. Again, Jesus said, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This book relegated the epistles to dusty old letters. That's where God was at then. 
we have to go to where he is now. Sold a lot of copies, but no revival came. Alpha may have sold a lot of copies and made a lot of money for some people, but it didn't bring revival. Neither did the God chasers. And now we have another gimmick called the purpose driven. The ideas of Bill Hybels, followed by Rick Warren. Again, it's based on marketing and marketing psychology. Biblically, agape love puts God first, others second, and ourselves last. Biblically, the question is, Lord, in what church do you want me to be to be used of you to meet the needs of others? Marketing psychology says, what church is going to meet my needs? There's a procedure twice outlawed by Congress in the United States called partial birth abortion, where you do a forcept extraction of a fetus in the process of being born through the birth canal. During the procedure, a suboccipital puncture is made into the cranium of the fetus, a suction catheter inserted, and the baby's brain sucked out while it's in the process of being born. Even many pro-abortion people were against it, and Congress outlawed it twice. Twice, the former president, Bill Clinton, vetoed it. Yet, when Bill Clinton appeared at Willow Creek Church in the suburbs of Chicago with Bill Hybels in front of thousands of evangelical pastors at a pastor's conference, there was not one question addressed to Mr. Clinton about partial birth abortion by Bill Hybels. Compare Bill Hybels to the prophet Isaiah, who openly confronted King Manasseh about the slaughter of children in Molech worship. Not a question at Willow Creek. Wouldn't be politically correct. In the aftermath of the events of September 11th, Bill Hybels had a Muslim clergyman from a mosque explaining Islam to Christians. Please find me a mosque that will allow me to preach the gospel to Muslims. Yet they look to Hybels? It's become even more absurd with the purpose-driven life, the purpose-driven church. You do your marketing research, find out what people want, and give it to them. Not a biblical premise for church growth or revival. It doesn't work. Purpose-driven will not work any more than God chasers, will not work any more than Toronto, Pensacola, Kansas City, Gold Dust, Promise Keepers, Alpha Courses, or any of the other nonsense people have pursued. Now again, I point out, those pursuing these things, many of them did so with a sincere motive. But you'd think that any realistic person, any rational person, any reasonable person would realize something's wrong here. What is the flavor of the month? They go from gimmick to gimmick, fad to fad, trend to trend, promising something that never happens. Who follows Purpose Driven? The same ones that followed Promise Keepers, or Alpha, or Toronto. Always the same churches, always the same leaders, always the same people. One nonsense after another, one miscarriage after another, but revival never comes. Absurdity of absurdities, now they've gone to the world wholesale. I watched an interview with Mel Gibson, the Australian-American film star, cum director, and this interview was conducted on Ash Wednesday of this year, 2004, by Diane Sawyer on American television. She asked Mr. Gibson, do you have to believe in Jesus Christ to go to heaven? Mr. Gibson responded, no, absolutely not. You do not have to believe in Jesus Christ to enter the kingdom. This was his belief when he made the Passion film, a film that was based on not the New Testament, but a book by Roman Catholic mystical nuns claiming to have visions. The film contains much historical and biblical inaccuracy. Things like Veronica, not in the Bible, Veronica itself. It's not the true image, it's a false image. We know from paleoarchaeology and forensic archaeology that in a Roman crucifixion, the nails were driven through the radius, not the metacarpal. Just the wrist, not through the palm of the hand. Yet, in the film, the nails go through the palm of the hand. Again, the Roman Catholic superstition of the stigmata. It's not even biblically accurate or historically accurate. Fortunately, that film did not do very well outside of the United States, except in certain Muslim countries where it was being used as anti-Semitic propaganda to generate Jew hatred. Yet, one evangelical pastor and leader after another were heralding that film as a way to evangelize, a film made by a man who says you don't have to believe in Jesus Christ to be saved. 
Well, the jury's no longer out. One poll found that less than one half of one percent of people seeing the film said it has had any profound if impact or effect on their religious beliefs. That was a poll conducted in the United States within the last month. But just one week ago in Australia, Mr. Gibson was interviewed. I don't know what the interview was, but it was published in a major Australian daily newspaper. And he was asked about the, the effect making the film had on him, the passion. And he said, I don't have to answer these kinds of questions anymore. I'm a hell of a lot richer than I used to be. You don't have to believe in Jesus Christ to go to heaven, says Mr. Gibson. Yet one silly, ignorant, naive, undiscerning evangelical pastor and leader after another applauded this film, Hollywood evangelism, silver screen evangelism. We have to go to the world to evangelize. No revival came or is coming. Just another nonsense. It doesn't work. It won't work. It can't work. Everyone is looking for a program, a gimmick, a fad, a prophecy, a promise, a way to bring revival. They look here, there, and everywhere, but not enough look to the one place they're going to find the answer, the Word of God. Much, much can be said about the subject of revival. To begin with, the word revival is not in the Bible in the way most people use it. But by historical definition, a revival is not a lot of people getting saved. A lot of people getting saved and discipled is the result of revival, the proof it happened, but it's not the revival. The revival is the church repenting, returning to its first love and God pouring out his spirit upon it. That is revival. Historically and biblically, no revival has ever begun with people laughing. Rodney Howard Brown lied. John Arnott lied. These men lied. Some of them printed lies. The apologeticist for Toronto, Guy Chevreau, wrote a book, Catch the Fire. He actually lied. He quoted Daniel Rowland from the Great Revival, saying this happened in the revivals of John Wesley and George Whitfield. Well, he did, but it so happens that book that he cites was published by Banner of Truth Press in Britain. I have the book. And it says that John Wesley said the hysterical laughter was demonic. It was not a move of God. People talk about those falling over in the great revivals of Jonathan Edwards and of John Wesley and George Whitfield. Yes, but it was unsaved people falling under the power of God, convicted of sin and repenting and being born again. It was not Christians acting like drunken jerks and lunatics. These people have lied. Many of the people who followed them did it in ignorance, but the leaders have not told the truth. I know of no euphemism for deception. But if you were into these movements, you've been lied to. Let's look at the truth. No revival has ever begun with people laughing. Every revival has begun with people weeping. But let's go beyond that. Let's understand something about what the Bible says about revival. There is much we can say. But one leader who did see revival come in his time, one man who understood revival was King Asa. Turn with me to 2 Chronicles, please, chapter 13, the reign of King Asa. Now, there will be those who will say, wait a minute, that's the Old Testament. The Old Testament is the only Bible that the early church had. It was good enough for Peter, James, and John. It's good enough for us. We are told in 1 Corinthians 10 that it was written for our instruction. We are told in Romans 15 that it was written for our instruction. Let us be instructed. This was the Bible of the early church. And the principles we find in the Old Testament are all reiterated in the New. There is nothing in the New that is not found foreshadowing Christ in the old. At the end of chapter 13, we read about the death of King Aviah. Not a very good king. Verse 21, but Aviah became powerful and took 14 wives to himself and became the father of 22 sons and 16 daughters. This propensity for multiple marriages seemed to run in the family, dating back several generations to King Solomon. It was a family trait womanizing. 
not exactly illegal or unlawful in the Old Testament, but something that got many kings in trouble and eventually ended in a split between the two kingdoms when it led Solomon into idolatry. Now the rest of the acts of Aviah and his words and his ways are written in the treaties of the prophet Edo. That word usually translated as treaties in English in the original Hebrew is midrash, midrash. Midrash is the way the ancient Jews interpreted the Bible. If you want to understand why the New Testament handles the Old Testament the way it does, it is using Jewish midrash. This is exactly what we see in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The New Testament handles the Old the way the Dead Sea Scrolls handle the Old Testament. This is midrash. Much can be said about this subject. I only mention it in passing. But the midrashim, the word, the term, is in Scripture. And it gives us the preface to what would happen in the reign of Asa. In Midrash, the narrative is not just a story. It is, among other things, a theological interpretation of the story. True in its historicity, but what's most important is what the history meant. So, Abiyah, which means in Hebrew, my father is Yahweh, slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David, and his son Asa became king in his place. The land was undisturbed for ten years during his days. Asa did good and right in the sight of the Lord his God. For he removed the foreign altars and the high places were torn down. The sacred pillars cut down the Asherim, and he commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and to observe the law and the commandment. He also removed the high places and the incense altars and all, and all the cities of Judah. And the kingdom was undisturbed under him. He built fortified cities in Judah, since the land was undisturbed and there was no one at war with him those years, because the Lord had given him rest. For he said to Judah, Let us build these cities and surround them with walls and towers, gates and bars. The land is still ours, because we have sought the Lord our God. We have sought him, and he has given us rest on every side. The land was still theirs because they sought the Lord their God. The reason for the growth of Eastern religion the reason for the growth of the cults, the reason the land is not still ours in so much of the Western world is because we've not sought the Lord our God. We have to understand that Islam is a judgment on the Judeo-Christian West for its backsliding. Much the same as early Islam was a judgment on the idolatry of the Byzantine Empire. It's false Christendom with its icon veneration. So today, Islam is a judgment on the Western world. Political leaders are in bed with very regimes that persecute Christians. American and British governments will back Saudi Arabia as our friends, turning a blind eye and a deaf ear to the cries of Christians who are hung or beheaded in countries like Saudi Arabia for becoming Christian. Governments are controlled by oil interests. Oil interests control governments. They're in bed with the very people who engender militant Islam that begets terror and that persecutes Christians and nobody says a word. Again, America, Britain, but protect the very regimes that persecute Christians. Islam is a judgment. It's a judgment on the West. Difficult for me to say that, having lost family in the events of September 11th. Difficult for me to say that to people who lost family in Madrid or in Lockerbie. Difficult for me to say that to a lot of people, but it's a judgment. Only when we seek the Lord, the land is ours. But let's continue. Concerning revival, we see a number of things that Asa understood that have since been forgotten by the contemporary church. The first thing we see is revival begins not by building up, but by tearing down. The same as revival does not begin with people weeping. Oh, yes, it does. We were told it begins with laughing. Revival begins with weeping, not laughing. So too, revival begins with bulldozing, not construction projects. Revival does not begin with a crane, it begins with a bulldozer. It begins by tearing down that which is not biblical. Unless someone is willing to tear down, it's pointless trying to build up. They're wasting their time, wasted efforts. Jesus spoke of the pruning process, get rid of the dead wood to make way for good growth unless the church is willing to get rid of that which is not biblical, 
to demolish it into rubble and then cart it off. You're building on a very shabby foundation that will not be able to sustain real growth. This has been part of the problem of the charismatic movement. Why, after more than 30 years, it has not brought revival or transformation. It left too many unbiblical things in practice. Oh, it's okay to pray to the dead. Oh, it is okay to believe that you're saved by sacraments. Oh, it is okay to base your doctrines on experience and mysticism instead of on scripture. They left too many unbiblical things in place, so they built in vain. Unless the Lord builds a house, the laborers build in vain, and for the last 30 years plus, the charismatic movement has built in vain. No revival has come. New age is the new spiritual movement. Revival does not begin with laughing, but with weeping. And it does not begin by building up. It begins by tearing down. Specifically, they tore down the high places in the Asherim, the female cult deities. They were torn down. Now, the Hebrew word for a high place is bimaot, bimaot. There was one high place where Yahweh ordained to be worshipped. Gadol Adonai meulal meod be'ir Eloheinu har kodesho. Yefenov sosmin kol ha'aretz. Ha'aretz i'on mi'er ketev sofon ha'kiriyat melakrav. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. The city of our God, the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for elevation, high place. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Idolatry did not begin by worshipping other gods on high places. It began by worshipping Yahweh the true God on other high places. Unbiblical worship will lead to false worship. We have to understand the original meaning of the Hebrew text. The Hebrew word for unbiblical worship and for open idolatry is the same term. Avodat zerah, avodat zerah. In the original Hebrew, the word for unbiblical worship and idolatry is the same. Why does God see it as the same? Because unbiblical worship today will inevitably lead to idolatry. You burn strange fire, before you know it, you'll be burning it to another god. To understand this, we have to look to the words of Jesus. The Father wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. When people make their own rules, Jesus said in Matthew 15, he quotes Isaiah saying that they worship in vain. There is no doxology without theology. If the doctrine is not right, the worship is not acceptable for God. It is all vanity. For instance, our faith is Christocentric, not pneumocentric. We've warned about this many times. The Holy Spirit is indeed God, and he's worshipped as God. He's worshipped as God because he is God. He's a person of the triunity of the Godhead. The Charles Wesley hymn, Holy, 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 God in Three Persons, that's perfectly biblical. But no place is the Holy Spirit ever worshipped or prayed to outside of the triunity of the Godhead in Scripture, not even once. In the Gospel of John, we're told he points people to the Lord Jesus, never himself. If Jesus is not being lifted up, it's not the Holy Spirit. It will be a counterfeit spirit. We pray to the Father in the name of the Son through the Spirit. Yet today, what kind of rubbish do you see being called worship? Good morning, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, let your fire fall. Holy Spirit, we worship you. None of that is biblical. It is not the Holy Spirit. People will wind up in blasphemy. They will wind up in carnality. They will wind up in Toronto or Pensacola. But they will not wind up before the throne of grace. That is not biblical worship. If it's God's Spirit, it points to Christ, never himself. The Father wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. Oh, it's not worship. It's just vanity. People draw attention to themselves. They began worshiping Yahweh in an unbiblical way on other high places other than the one he ordained. When you worship the true God in the wrong way today, you'll be in idolatry tomorrow. To understand this, we have to understand much of this idolatry centered around Baal worship. Baal is the Hebrew word for husband, master, and owner. Yahweh, according to Isaiah and according to the prophet, prophet Hosea, was Israel's Baal. Your husband is your maker. Yet the Canaanites had their Baal going back to a variation of Marduk worship from ancient Babylon. Baal Shemaim, who had a resurrection myth every spring. He's Baal. Yahweh is Baal. Two gods called Baal being worshipped in the same high place. To understand this, look at, for instance, Mormonism, the Latter-day Saints as they call themselves. We're the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. 
Their Jesus Christ is the half-brother of Satan, according to the Book of Mormon. The Jesus Christ of the Bible is monogenes in Greek, the only begotten of the Father. Now, they have the same name, Jesus Christ, but it's a different Jesus Christ. So it was with Baal worship. Similarly, you have Allah. There are two essential Arabic words for God, El and Allah. But Allah was also not just a generic name for God, it was the name of the Arabian moon god. Oh, we have Allah? He's not the Elohim of the Bible. He's not the God of the Christians and Jews. Just because he comes in the same name, you worship the true God in the wrong way, and then another comes in his name. Jesus warned, many will come in my name. But then they took down the female cult deities. From Fatima, Lords, Noct, Magigori, we're seeing an explosive uh, interest in the cult of Mary within Roman Catholicism, and many so-called Protestants are compromising with it. The Bible says directly, there is one intercessor between God and man, Jesus the righteous, not Mary. Her real name was not Mary, her real name was Miriam. Miriam. She was a Jewish girl with dark hair, dark eyes, and dark Semitic features. She did not have blonde hair and blue eyes. In a replay of the Song of Deborah from the book of Judges, chapter 5, an angel called Gavriel in Hebrew, the mighty one of God, comes to this Jewish girl, Miriam, and tells her, she is the greatest woman who ever lived. Blessed are you among women. You will be the mother of the Messiah in the Magnificat, who will save his people from their sin. Now, the only thing the greatest woman who ever lived could say when she was told she was going to be the mother of the Messiah who would save his people is, my soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Mary says she needs to be saved. The Bible says all have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God. Only Jesus had no sin, because we all have sinned and couldn't save ourselves. That's why God had to become a man. The term theotokos is not in the Bible, Mother of God. Mary said she needs a Savior. Miriam said she needs a Savior. If the greatest woman who ever lived said she needs a savior, if the Holy Spirit inspired St. Matthew to put that in the Bible, if God's word says all have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God, I have a choice. I can believe Mary. I can believe the apostles. I can believe the word of God. Or I can believe the Roman papacy. And I want to assure you, I'm neither an anti-Semite nor anti-Catholic. My family is a mixture of Roman Catholic and Jewish. My children are Israelis, born in Galilee. My mother is a Catholic. I was sent to Catholic school, albeit against my will in my youth. I know its doctrines. I'm not against Catholic people, and I'm not against Jewish people. But Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, and Roman Catholicism cannot possibly be biblical Christianity. Remember Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, for all of their faults, every one of the reformers, every one of the Protestant reformers, for all of their mistakes, and they made plenty were Roman Catholic priests who read the Bible. They were not simply from the Roman Catholic clergy, they were from the intelligentsia of the Roman Catholic clergy. Humanist scholars. And they realized by reading the scriptures and studying the original meaning in the original language that they'd been lied to. Salvation is not by sacraments. I'm justified by faith, saved by grace. It's the new birth. Mary told the truth. She needed a savior. If she had no sin, it would have had to mean her mother had no sin. And if her mother had no sin, it would have meant her mother had to have no sin. It's not even a logical argument. But the Bible says all have sinned. Because of a papal encyclical, Munificentissimus Deus, they believed she had no sin, even though she said she needed to be saved from it. I love Miriam. I esteem Miriam. I think Miriam is sensational. I think Miriam is terrific. I think Miriam is the greatest woman who ever lived. I greatly look forward to meeting Miriam. But I want nothing to do with that stupid, dumb, blonde, bimbo shiksa, Mary. That is not Miriam. That is simply a pseudo-Christianization of the ancient female cult deities. Minerva, Diana of Ephesus, Ashtaroth, Ashtat, the very things Asa got rid of. There is one intermediary between God and man, Jesus the righteous. One. 
She did not co-save us or co-redeem us. Her son is the redeemer. Mary said, listen to my son. Whatever he does, whatever he tells you, that's what you should do. We should come to him. Mary can't help us. She was the greatest woman who ever lived. And if the greatest person, the greatest woman who ever lived, needed a savior, how much more do the rest of us? Let's go further. <laughs> he got rid of these things. He knew that this junk had to be thrown out before revival could come. Asa understood revivals begin not with building up, but with tearing down that which is not biblical. I don't care how much purpose-driven nonsense people go into, how many gimmicks, how many fads, I don't care what flavor of the month is, I promise you there will be no revival. Revival cannot come to the body of Christ in the Western world. Revival cannot come until what is unbiblical is removed. People will say, you're judgmental, you're critical. No, I'm biblical. Show me where I'm wrong from the Bible. I want to see revival. They'll say, oh, you don't want to build up, you just want to tear down. No, I want to build up, therefore we have to tear down. Unless you tear down, you're wasting your time. Don't bother building, because whatever you build will not stand. Asa understood this. Just as revival begins with people weeping, not with people laughing, so revival begins with tearing down, not with building up. The second thing he understood is this. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers. He commanded. Hebrew prayers are prefaced with the introduction, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe. Jesus in Hebrew was called HaMelech HaMlachim, the King of Kings. Kings, by definition, don't invite, they decree. Jesus said, go out to the highways and byways and tell them the king commands they come in, compel them to come in. Not by use of force, but by use of regal command, divine command. Look at how the apostles preached. In the book of Acts, chapter 2, Peter said, save yourself from this crooked and perverse generation. The book of Acts tells us God commands men to repent. Commands. Anybody who God has ever used to bring revival, be it George Whitfield, John Wesley, D.L. Moody, they all preach the same way, biblically. God commands men to repent. I don't mean preaching at people. That's not preaching to them. But I do mean it's appointed to man once to die and after this the judgment. Unless we preach law, people will never understand grace. Unless people know that they're lost and bound for judgment, they won't know how good it is to have a Savior who paid the price for their sin. God commands men to repent. The early influences of somebody who was well-intentioned but who was in serious doctrinal error have come now to take over most of the church's evangelism. This man was somebody who was called Charles Finney. He bordered on being an absolute heretic because he denied original sin. The Bible says we're born with a fallen nature, therefore we must be born again. Finney did some good, perhaps, but he certainly did much damage. And I think he came to realize that before he died. Now, I myself am not a Calvinist. I'm not reformed in any sense. I don't think that's biblical. But either is the Pelagianism, which denies original sin. People are fallen. They're condemned. They need to know that they're condemned. Only God can intervene and cause people to be saved. But he commands people to repent. He doesn't invite. Something has happened from the influences of Mr. Finney. The sovereignty of God is downplayed in salvation. But also what happens is, is this idea where we simply have to respond to his love. Even Finney never taught that, even though it derived from the implications of what he did teach. It began with things like the four spiritual laws. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Bill Bright ended his life signing up with the Roman Catholic Ecumenical Movement. Late John Wimber said, we're going to take the gospel out of the language of the courtroom and put it into the family drawing room. Instead of God as judge, he's going to be God as loving father. Well, the Holy Spirit inspired Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to put the gospel in the language of the courtroom. 
Jesus was put on trial in my place. I and you, we were guilty of the things he was wrongly put on trial for. We actually did the things he was falsely accused of. It was in the courtroom. Unless we understand God as an angry judge, we'll never be in a position to come to him as a loving father. Our sin was judged on the cross. Wimber was wrong. You have to preach law before you do grace. God commands men to repent. But the things like Alpha Courses, Purpose Driven, the influences of Robert Schuller, it's emotional manipulation from the world of psychology. It's God loves you. Every eye closed, every head bowed. Accept Jesus into your heart. Slip your hand up. This is emotional froth. That's not the gospel. We'd like to invite you to accept Jesus. This is a lot of silly garbage. It is not biblical and it does not work. God commands men to repent. King Asa understood that. In my youth, when I was in university, I was a cocaine addict. I had what society would call a drug problem. I didn't have a drug problem. I had a sin problem. God commanded me to repent. It's appointed to man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Story then continues. He understood. God commands. He is sovereign. King's command. He understood you had to tear down before you build up, but he also understood something else. He understood that you have to use the good times to prepare for the bad. When the church is revived, when God's people begin to become revived, when they do seek God, an attack will come. Use the good times to prepare for the bad, much the same as Joseph understood the need to use the plump years to prepare for the lean ones. When opposition came, when attack came, because he used the good times to build up and prepare for the bad, he was ready. When the bad times come, they don't have to be bad for us. Rather than being mere opposition, the opposition becomes transformed into opportunity if you use the good times to prepare for the bad. They don't have to be bad for us. They don't have to be bad for me. They don't have to be bad for you. Rather, the opposition becomes opportunity. He understood that. Christians who will stand best during trials, Christian families, Christian marriages that will stand best during trials are the ones who are consistently faithful. When things are going well, their prayer time, their fellowshipping, their witnessing, their devotional life, those things are consistently good. When opposition comes, those people will stand trials much better. So when the trouble comes, it doesn't have to be trouble for them. Rather, it becomes opportunity. Now, because God is gracious, because he is faithful even when we are unfaithful, he may intervene anyway and save our necks when opposition comes. But it's going to be at a much higher price. And instead of it being an opportunity to expand, to prosper, to be blessed, it's simply going to be a lesson in divine correction that should have been something much different. Oh, God may intervene and save our necks, but he will use it as a way to correct what's wrong with us. But if we're consistently faithful, if we use the good times to prepare for the future, when the bad times come, they don't have to be bad for us. Opposition becomes opportunity. Asa also understood that. There is no move of God that will not be attacked by the enemy. And he's attacked by two enemies. His first enemy is the Ethiopian, and then the ten backslidden tribes of the north. Remember, every king of Israel, every king of the ten northern tribes, with the, pos with the partial and possible exception of Jehu, everyone with the partial and possible exception of Jehu was a backslider, every king. Judah, you had good kings and bad in the south. But then there was the Ethiopian. Why is it the Ethiopian and the north? Simple. Not many generations earlier, Malkisheva, the queen of Sheba, heard the wisdom of Solomon. She brought the Torah and monotheism back to Ethiopia when she heard the wisdom of Solomon, Shlomo HaMelech. The Ethiopians began to monotheize and turn to the Jewish God. They turned away from it. 
most of what the Bible says about black Africans is good. The Hebrew word for a black African is a kushi. A kushi. Kushi is also the Hebrew word for an Ethiopian. In Hebrew, the word for an Ethiopian and a black African is the same word, a kushi, someone from the land of Kush. They didn't know about Zambia or about Zimbabwe or about Kenya. They knew about Ethiopia. And so you get the word for black African is a kushi from the land of Kush. Okay. Nearly everything the Bible says about black Africans, about Kushin, is good. When Ahi Mahaz was the unfaithful messenger, it was a Kushi who was the faithful one at the death of Absalom. When his own people abandoned him and he was tossed into a cistern, it was a black African who rescued Jeremiah the prophet, Yemiahu Hanavi. Jesus said, you should be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. It begins with Jews, then mongrel Jews like me, they were the Samaritans, but the first total non-Jew that Jesus ever saved that we have a biblical record of was the Ethiopian eunuch. The first person Jesus saved, not from a Jewish background, broadly speaking, inclusive of the Samaritans, the first total non-Jew was a black African. Nearly everything the Bible says about black people is good. The black man has always tended to respond to the gospel first. The Coptic church, although it is no longer biblical in most of its doctrines, it is a very old church. In, in, in North um, Eastern African continent. Black man always responded first. In my Native America, where the term born again became popular, it became popular after the American president, Carter, said he was born again. It was not a generally well-known term. However, black people always knew what it meant because nearly every black person had a gray-haired black grandmother who was born again praying for their salvation. Nearly everything the Bible says about black people is positive. This is the one really outstanding exception. Why? Because like the ten northern tribes of Israel, the Ethiopian fell away from the truth they received. They backslid. The two attacks that come against Judah during the reign of King Asa are from those who backslid and turned against the truth. The most dangerous and sinister enemies of God's people when there's a move of God will not be the pagan or the unbeliever. It'll be the backslidden. At the moment in Australia, an anti-vilification law is being perverted and misused to restrict the freedom of Christians to speak out. Christians are being dragged to court by Muslims. Not a single Islamic country will give Christians the freedom that they demand in Australia. Yet in Australia, Christians are now being denied the freedom by Muslims that Muslims deny Christians in Muslim countries with the help of the lunatic left. And you know, the Uniting Church, liberal Protestant churches, the Roman Church are taking the side of the Muslims against the evangelicals. Unspeakable. The Pharisees and Sadducees hated each other. Yet they collaborated with each other and with the Romans against Jesus. <laughs> the most serious and sinister enemy of God's true people will be the backslidden. The Romans were not the problem. The Romans were not the main problem. The main problem was the Lord's own kind, the hypocritical Sanhedrin, the religious leadership that turned the people against him. That was the problem. It's the same today. Islam is not the main problem. Those people are unbelieving. The main problem are the backslidden churches and denominations who give credence to it and who will team up with them against believers. A pope who will kiss the Koran while Christians are being murdered in the millions in Islamic countries. That's our first enemy. Asa found this out. The biggest enemies of the cause of Christ will be those who have apostatized. I'm much more, much more, much more concerned with men like Chuck Colson, who signed and drafted evangelicals and Catholics together. I'm much more worried about him than I am the Vatican. Much more. I'm much more concerned with evangelicals who will give credence to unbelieving religion, to false faiths. You get in bed with the Pope, he's in bed with the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama said there's no creator. I saw him say that on television in South Africa. He said there's no creator but we can still be one with Christians and Jews by closing our eyes together and meditating about things like peace. 
that although the Dalai Lama says there's no creator, he allows himself to be worshipped as a reincarnation of the Buddha. Pope John Paul II calls that man a great spiritual leader. Pope John Paul II took the anointing of the Hindu god of death on his forehead, Shiva. Pope John Paul II kissed the Koran, a book that says God has no son, which according to 1 John chapter 4 is antichrist in doctrine. Yet Mr. Coulson and others like him will applaud the Pope as a Christian. They'll call this man a Christian. Not biblically. Our first enemy will be the one who turns from the truth. The real enemies of the cause of Christ today are men like Colson. Those who signed the evangelicals and Catholics together, like J.I. Packer. These are the ones who are the most dangerous, not the pagan. So the Ethiopian comes against God's people. And what do we see? Verse 8, Now Asa had an army of 300,000 from Judah bearing large shields and spears, and 280,000 from Benjamin bearing shields and wielding bows. All of them were valiant warriors. With God, quality is always more important than quantity. Quality above quantity. The people with the biggest churches are going to have the least impact for Christ in spiritual war and evangelism. They will have the least impact. Now Zerah the Ethiopian came out against them with an army of a million men, nearly double, and 300 chariots. He had the chariots, as it were, the armor brigades. And he came out to Marasha. So Asa went out to meet him, and they drew up in battle formation in the valley of Zephatah at Marasha. Zephatah comes from the Hebrew infinitive lisro, to burn as in to test by fire. Then Asa called to the Lord, There is no one other than you to help in the battle between the powerful and those who have no strength. So help us, O Lord our God, for we trust in you and in your name have come out against this multitude. O Lord, you are our God. Let not man prevail against you. We have to understand the mentality of the Near East, which endures to this day. Let not man prevail against you. If you win a battle or a war, it represents the fact in their mentality, the cultural mentality, that your God is greater than theirs. If you lose, it represented that your God was inferior to theirs. Why did God give America and Britain victory quickly over Iraq? Why was Israel protected from weapons of mass destruction or anything of this nature, even when Saddam Hussein was known to have them? Is it because America, Britain, and Israel are righteous nations? No, I live in Britain. My family are from Britain. I was born in America, and my wife and children are Israeli Jews who believe in Jesus. I have allegiances to three countries, America, Israel, and Britain. These are the three countries in history that have had the most biblical influence in their heritage. No three nations in history have had more gospel or more truth or more biblical input into their foundations and societies as Israel, the United States, and the United Kingdom. Yet they are three backslidden entities that have turned their back on their biblical heritage. They are not righteous nations. They are unrighteous nations. Why does God bless, protect Britain, America, and Israel? Because if he didn't, Muslims would say, Allahu Akbar, Allah has given us victory over the infidel. To them it would mean Allah is greater than Jesus, the Koran is more true than the Bible. God has to be sure he upholds his word. He watches over it to perform it. He will not give his glory to another. God has to cause Islam to be humiliated and defeated in order to undermine its credibility, that Muslims will see it for the lie it is and turn to the real God and turn to the real Savior and the true prophet, Jesus. That's what I have to do. Don't let man prevail over you. The battle is not simply between nations or civilizations. It's between spiritual forces, between God and Satan. Jesus is God who became a man. The mentality of Islam is Allah will give us victory in the 
jihad, the holy war against the infidel. Well, you see, this explains much of the hatred Islam has for Israel and for the Christian West. After six jihads, 150 million Muslims can't beat four or five million Jews. It's an indictment of their religion. It, it is emblematic of, of its lack of credibility, that, that, that Islam is not true. Because if it was true, they should be winning. They would say, of course, it's because America backs Israel. America did not begin to back Israel until 1973 in a big way. But in 1967, when the Muslims were being backed by the Soviet Empire, is when Israel captured that land. It's simply not true, and they know it's not true. The believability of their religion is being undermined by the presence of Israel and the victories that God gives to the Judeo-Christian West. Not because there's anything good about America, Britain, or Israel, but because there's something false about Islam. God will not give his glory to another. For his own namesake, he intervenes even though he will still use Islam as an instrument of judgment. So the story continues. Let them not prevail against you. So the Lord rooted the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. Asa and the people who were with him pursued them as far as Gerar, and so many Ethiopians fell that they could not recover for they were shattered before the Lord and before his army, and they carried away very much plunder. They destroyed all the cities around Gerard, for the dread of the Lord had fallen on them, and they despoiled all the cities, for there was much plunder in them. They also struck down those who owned livestock, and they carried away large numbers of sheep and camels. Then they returned to Jerusalem. When there's a move of God, when there's a repentance, when it's something genuine, not the kind of rubbish that's being tooted today. Not the Rodney Brown thing or the John Arnott thing or the things pushed by the Elam movement in New Zealand and, and, and Britain. Not the deceptions and counterfeits. A real move of God, it will be attacked. But the opposition becomes an opportunity. It becomes unstoppable as long as the people seek their God. Something happens, however. The following verse, chapter 15, verse 1. Now the Spirit of God came to Azariah, Azariah, the son of Oded. Azariah in Hebrew means Yahweh is help, or the help of Yahweh. He's the son of Oded. Sonship in Hebrew thought, in biblical thought, is not simply pedigree, it's in the character of. The help of God in the character of Oded. Oded in Hebrew means encouragement. If you were to translate son of Oded, Ben Oded, into Aramaic, it would be Barnabas, Barnabas, son of encouragement. A prophet is sent to warn him. Now notice in the Bible, God had only ever sent prophets when things were bad or in danger of going bad. God only sent prophets when things were bad or in danger of going bad. If things were good, you wouldn't need a prophet. False prophets will always tickle people's ears and tell them what they want to hear. A true prophet will tell them what they need to hear. And it says, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. We are all indwelt with the Holy Spirit. But to prophesy, the Holy Spirit has to come upon someone and give someone the prophecy in that instance. This is true with any gift of the Spirit. The power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. Luke 5, 17, the Greek word dunamis. Jesus only healed one paralytic at the pool of Bethesda, the one his father told him to. We can always pray for the sick or anoint them with oil. Then it's good that we do. It's right that we do. But if you're going to command someone to get out of a deathbed or a wheelchair or command a heart disease or an aneurysm or a cancer to disappear, the Holy Spirit has to come on you and be telling you to do that in that situation, or it won't happen. So it is with tongues. Tongues can be demonic, which doctors do it in Africa, shamans do it. Tongues can be purely psychological babbling and gibberish. Tongues can be learned or contrived. There are actually people who say, just move your lips like this. And you. There can be some combination of those things, or it can be an authentic gift of the Holy Spirit. 
unless the Holy Spirit comes on someone and gives them that tongue in that situation, it's not real. Well, prophecy is no different. The Spirit had to come on him and give him a prophecy. In the Bible, this was not an everyday event. Many of the prophets went a long time before they had a prophetic revelation of that nature. And it was always in agreement with what was in Scripture. Today, when you see people going around, I have a word for you, and the Lord gave me a picture, and the Lord would say this to you, and you see people like Cindy Jacobs and Rick Joyner, this is not prophecy. This is clairvoyance. It's an occult practice. They may call it Christian, but it's not biblical prophecy. It's clairvoyance. That's why Cindy Jacobs' prophecies about Zimbabwe or, or Rick Joyner's prophecies in his book, The Harvest, didn't happen. They're not prophets. They're clairvoyants. They're false prophets. The Holy Spirit to come on you and give the prophecy. And here the Spirit comes on him right after a victory. There is always a danger in victory. The Duke of Wellington, for whom the capital of New Zealand is named, who commanded the British forces in the Battle of Waterloo against Napoleon, he said, the challenge of victory is at least as big as the challenge of defeat. If you lose the battle, you know what you have to do. You have to reorganize. You have to make a new plan. If you lose, you know what you have to do. But if you win, what do you do now? Sort of like the Americans and British have found out in Iraq. Well, you won, but what do you do now? It is difficult to get to the top of the mountain. But once you get to the top of the mountain, it's easy to fall off. Having been to the Southern Hemisphere so many times and watching the Tri-Nation and the Super 12 rugby teams, I was always of the mind, always of the opinion, that never in a Rugby World Cup could a Northern Hemisphere team from the Six Nations, where I live in Britain, Never could a Northern Hemisphere team defeat the All Blacks or the Wallabies or the Springboks from South Africa or Australia or New Zealand. <coughs> I just thought the Southern Hemisphere teams were too good. They were invincible. I never thought one of our teams from the Northern Hemisphere could, in the World Cup, defeat a Southern Hemisphere team. I didn't think that was a realistic possibility. I was wrong. The English Lions did. They defeated the Australians, albeit narrowly. <coughs> it's quite a situation. Right after becoming world champions, they lost the European Championship to the French and have since been losing consistently. It's easy to fall off the top of the mountain. It's just hard to get up there. You can battle and battle and battle and struggle to get to the top. Once you get to the top, it's easy to fall off. There is a danger in victory. The danger comes from elation. When God blesses us, when God prospers us, when God gives us a victory, praise God, give God the glory, and it's not wrong to rejoice. But take heed. Take heed. It's hard to get to the top, but easy to roll down to the bottom. Asa found that out. God sent the prophet to warn him. A revival must keep going or else it will begin to disintegrate. Just think of a projectile or a rocket or a missile. Inertia will only carry it so far. It can only remain static for a brief moment and then it will come down. Either it's having continual propulsion or else its trajectory is going to turn downward. If a revival is not going forward, it will begin to collapse, disintegrate. It requires continual growth. Evangelism is always the lifeblood of the church, and evangelism must be followed by a radical approach to discipleship. I've seen programs that were radically evangelistic, but they had no discipleship and they didn't last. About a hundred years ago, there was a revival in Wales, in the coal collieries and in the mining valleys of Wales. It was over within 18 months. They had plenty of evangelism, but they had no discipleship. Here today, gone tomorrow. The inertia won't carry you very far. Continual propulsion is necessary. He's warned. He's warned by the prophet Azariah. When God begins to move, when God begins to bless, it's not wrong to rejoice, but it's wrong to become inebriated with elation. This is dangerous. 
I can only think of the nation Israel after the Six Day War in 1967. They were elated. They, they defeated armies more than 10 times their own size, backed by the Soviet Empire and humiliated the Muslim world. They left the Soviet Union publicly humiliated. They were elated. Six years later, the Americans were rushing an arms lift to try to stop them from losing everything they gained in the Yom Kippur War. There's a danger in elation. When God blesses, take heed, take stock. The Spirit of God came on Ezariah, the son of Oded, and he went out to meet him, and he said, Listen to me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. He addresses the leader first, but not only the leader, the nation and the people. And he says something that's reiterated three times in this text. He says, The Lord is with you when you are with him. And if you seek him, he will let you find him. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. The book of Romans tells us that because we're imagio dei beings, because we are made in God's image and likeness, people can know there's one true God. Even a heathen can know there's one true God. You always get the story, what about the native on the island who never heard the gospel? How can God send him to hell? He can know there's one true God, according to Romans. He can know that he has sin, and that the sin must be repented of and atoned for, and he can know he should treat others the way he wants others to treat him. He can know that because he's made in God's image and likeness. This is not a natural theology, but it is an imagio dei theology. We are theopomorphic men and women. We're made in God's image and likeness. People can know they're responsible. And he's told here, the Lord is with you when you're with him. If you seek him, you will find him. Anybody of any culture or any circumstance who seeks the true God, God will find him. However, he's also told, the Lord is with you when you are with him. One of the great deceptions in the church is Calvinism, an unbiblical humanism that has redefined Christianity in terms of Reformed and Covenant theology. There are two corruptions of biblical Christianity that cannot assure people the, the absolute guarantee of salvation. One is Calvinism and the other is Roman Catholicism. In Roman Catholicism, according to the Council of Trent in their own catechism, imprimatur, if you say you're sure you're going to heaven, you've committed the sin of presumption. Calvinism, on the other hand, is the same. Only God knows whose name is in the book of life and is foreordained, who's predestined to heaven, who's predestined to hell. Neither Calvinism nor Roman Catholicism can give people the assurance of salvation. A Roman Catholic is doing good works, going to a novena or whatever they're doing in order to try to get saved. A Calvinist is doing good works to try to prove they are saved. Neither can give the assurance of salvation. But the Bible says something different. The Bible teaches neither Roman Catholicism or Calvinism. The Lord is with you when you are with him. You can know you're going to heaven. Those who've repented of their sin and trusted Jesus as the atonement for their sin and trust that he rose from the dead to give them eternal life, those who pick up their cross and follow him, who have his spirit and live by his word, you can be sure you're going to heaven. There's an assurance, an absolute guarantee, an assurance of salvation. You don't have to worry about, is my name in the book? If you're with the Lord, he's with you. You don't have to worry about, did I do enough novenas? Forget novenas. If you're with him, he's with you. Novenas are made to St. Jude, the patron of hopeless cases. There's nothing more hopeless than a religious system that can't assure you of salvation. The Lord is with you when you are with him. However, if you forsake him, he will forsake you. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We are eternally secure in Christ, but free will is restored at the cross. To be eternally secure, you must remain in Christ. If you forsake him, he'll forsake you. The Bible does teach eternal security, but it does not teach the Calvinistic perversion of it. Hebrews chapter 6 and Hebrews chapter 10 tells us this. People who were partakers of the Holy Spirit and then fall away 
If they go too far and don't repent, they don't return to the Lord, they do not have that assurance. If you forsake him, he will forsake you. Yes, we are eternally secure in Christ. Stay in Christ and you'll have no problem. Both Roman Catholicism and Calvinism are wrong. Both of them derive from Augustine of Hippo, not directly from the New Testament. They both come from the Platonized Christianity, the Platonic philosophies by which Augustine of Hippo reinvented Christendom. They don't come from the Word of God. God's with you if you're with Him. You're eternally secure if you stay in Christ. You can know it. But let's continue. For many days Israel was without a teaching priest, without law, without the true God. Without the true God, without a teaching priest, and without law. But in their distress they turned to the Lord God of Israel, and they sought him, and he let them find him. In those times there was no peace to him who went out or to him who came in. For many nations afflicted all the inhabitants of the lands. Now notice what it says. They did not have the true God, but the order is important because they did not have the law of God or a teaching priest, clergy who will expand scriptures. Once a civilization, a society, no longer has the word of God, that's what Torah means, the way to God. The Bible is Jesus, the way to God. He's the Logos, the way to God. It's his word. Once you no longer have the Word of God and you no longer have a clergy who will teach the Word of God, rightly dividing it, people will no longer have the true God. They'll have another God. You'll have silly people like you have today writing books, as John Stott wrote, you can't be sure there's an eternal hell. The Bible says there is. Greek term, enyon ton enyone, is forever and ever. The smoke of their torment went up forever and ever. It's the same term in Greek used for the high priesthood of Jesus, the glory of God, and our salvation. Biblically, if heaven is not forever, forever, how can hell be? And if hell's not, how can you be sure heaven is? In other words, if hell's not eternal and conscious, how can you know heaven is? When the Bible uses the same term to describe both. They have another, they have another, 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 something of their own invention. Many people have another Jesus today. The Mormons don't have the Jesus of the Bible. People have a Jesus hanging on a crucifix. The Bible says he rose from the dead. He doesn't continue to die sacramentally in the Mass. People have a Jesus of their own invention, even a God of their own invention. Instead of us being theopomorphic men and women, they have an anthropomorphic God. They make God to believe to be what they want to believe he is. You don't have the true God because you no longer have the Word of God or a teaching priest. You no longer have a clergy who will expound it. Today, much of what is called preaching is bogus. It is not exegetical. It is not exposition of scripture. It is rather psychology using Christian jargon. Again, this goes back to the influences of Robert Schuller. It is motivational speaking using Christian jargon. It is not exposition of a text. When they take the scriptures, it is often out of context. They're using Gnosticism some subjective mystical interpretation of a text out of all reasonable context to make it say what they want it to say. As a result, they no longer worship the real God. They worship one of their own minds. Again, the order is important. What happens? For many days they were without the true God because they were without a teaching priest and without the law. The Bible has been systematically denigrated. Even churches which a generation ago were strong in their biblical emphasis, like the Plymouth Brethren, have gone downhill. The old-time Pentecostals, not to be confused with the present state of things in most of the English-speaking nations, were stronger than word. That's gone. The Baptist churches were one time synonymous with a strong biblical emphasis. In too many cases, that's no longer the case at all. Lost the word of God. Instead, it's psychology, motivational speaking. Instead of a teaching priest, instead of a clergy that expounds the Word of God, it's motivational speaking, it's anecdotes, it's stories, it's hype, it's Hillsong, or some other such thing. And they wind up with a belief in God that is alien to the God of the Bible. 
The result of this will always be chaos, we are told. Chaos. But in their distress, they turned to the Lord God of Israel, and they sought him, and he let them find him. That's the second time we see this reiterated. Seek him, and you'll find him. Unfortunately, too often it requires distress before people will seek him. What will it take to make people realize we have to tear down before we build up? That we have to weep before we can laugh? That God commands, he doesn't invite? It will likely take distress. I would have hoped things like September 11th would have woken more Christians to the reality. But it hasn't. How much distress will it take before people go to a biblical path to seek God instead of the nonsense and hype, the gimmicks, the fads, the flavor of the month stupidity that they chase after today? A road to nowhere instead of the real road to revival. But the story continues. In verse 6, nation was crushed by nation and city by city. For God troubled them with every kind of distress. But you be strong and do not lose courage, for there is reward for your work. If we were to read this in the Greek, the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, instead of the Hebrew, we would see it is paraphrased in the Olivet Discourse by St. Matthew. Matthew translates Jesus' words from Aramaic into a paraphrase of the Greek text of this. Nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Here it is city against city, but of course, in Greek, the word polis were city-states, sort of like Singapore is both a nation and a state. So, for instance, ancient Babylon was both a city and an empire. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. That word nation is goyim, goyim in Hebrew, in Greek, ethnon. The conflicts of the last days will be like this. This is a microcosm of the last days. The New Testament recycles this eschatologically to tell us what the last days will be like. Nation against nation. It is ethnon. It is ethnic conflict. The last 75 years have seen ethnic conflict. Ethnic cleansing. The Jews, the Serbs, the Croats, the Gypsies. We're not simply talking about skin color. In Yugoslavia, it was white on white, but it was still nation against nation. In Rwanda or Burundi, with the Hutu and Tutsi, it was black against black, but it was still nation against nation. After the Australians and Americans left Vietnam, the Vietnamese and Chinese had a war, and then the Vietnamese and Cambodians had a war. It was yellow against yellow, but it was still nation against nation. The political conflicts of the last days are the result of ethnic conflicts. Mankind can never be one except in Christ. They tried to do it by building a Tower of Babel or United Nations, but it doesn't work. But look what it says. God troubled them. The Great Tribulation will not simply be the deeds of Satan or man reaping what he sowed. It will be the judgment and wrath of God outpoured. This is what the Bible calls the day of the Lord. When the church is removed, when the faithful believers are taken out of here, the day of the Lord commences, and God will pour out his wrath. This is the day of the Lord. God will trouble them. It will be his wrath poured out on the kingdom of Antichrist. Again, this is a microcosm and a foreshadowing of what will happen in the last days. But you be strong and do not lose courage, for there is reward for your work. As Jesus said, when you see these things happening, lift up your head, your redemption draws near. Now when Asa heard these words of the prophet, which Azariah, the son of Oded, the prophet, spoke, he took courage and removed the abominable idols from all the land of Judah and Benjamin and from the cities which he had captured in the hill country of Ephraim. He then restored the altar of the Lord, which was in front of the porch of the Lord. He gathered all Judah and Benjamin and those from Ephraim, Manasseh, and Simeon who resided with them, for many defected to him from Israel when they saw the Lord God, his God, was with him. So they assembled at Jerusalem in the third month of the fifteenth year of Asa's reign. They sacrificed to the Lord that day seven hundred oxen and seven thousand sheep.
from the spoil they had bought. They entered into the covenant to seek the Lord, the God of their fathers, with all their heart and soul. And whoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel should be put to death, whether small or great, man or woman. Moreover, they made an oath to the Lord with a loud voice and shouting with trumpets and with horns. All Judah rejoiced concerning the oath, for they had sworn with their whole heart and had sought him earnestly, and he let them find him. So the Lord gave them rest on every side. King Asa was a man who went from good to better and better to better still. After he had the victory and the warning came, he took heed of that warning and he continued his reforms and became more radical. Only they spread north to Ephraim. It was not just Judah, it expanded. A revival by nature will expand. Now look what happens. He now begins tearing down the altars, the high places, that which was abominable to God in his own territory of Benjamin and Judah, but in Ephraim as well. And he restores the altar of the Lord. The singular most important type of the cross of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, the most important shadow, is the altar, what we call in Hebrew, Mesabeach, where blood atonement for sin was made on the altar. It's a type of the cross. As the epistle to the Hebrews tells us, when Jesus hung on the cross in our place and died for our sin, he was the high priest making atonement, blood atonement on the altar, a korban for sin. The altar had to be restored. In any revival, there must be a restoration of the cross, a radical return to the theme of the cross. Now again, this stands in diametric opposition to what we see today. About a hundred years ago, there was a growth of certain occult movements. From this occult movement came something called Christian science, which was neither Christian nor scientific. This movement was astounding. It's leader and founder, its primary leader and founder, was a very strange woman whose name uh, became synonymous with, with the movement. She had the view that old age was an illusion, that illness was an illusion, that even death itself was an illusion. And she went on teaching these things. Well, eventually, she fell victim to the illusion of old age, then to the illusion of illness, and alas, voila, la grande illusion. Quite a situation. Her beliefs were cultic, but they were picked up by certain hyper-Pentecostals who went into heresy, one of which was E.W. Kenyon, and another, influenced by him and by her indirectly, was William Branham, a man who denied the Trinity and prophesied that the Trinity is of the devil. The woman's name was Mary Baker Eddy. This whole belief system, my body is lying to me. I don't have a fever, my body's lying. This is the occult beliefs of Christian science come into hyper-Pentecostalism. By distorting the original meaning of the Greek text of the New Testament out of context, where you have a translation problem in the King James for the word Hades into hell, they came up with the idea that Jesus went to hell and was tortured in hell by Satan. Now, in fact, Jesus went to Hades. He went to the place of the fathers, the bosom of Abraham, and revealed himself to the Old Testament saints. They could not go to heaven until he died for sin. They're saved by the same blood of Jesus as we are. On the cross, the Lord Jesus said, It is finished. Father, into your hands I give my spirit. The victory was won on the cross. When he died, he went to be with the Father. However, these people took the idea that Satan got the victory on the cross, and Jesus went to hell for three days and three nights and had to be born again in hell. Now, this is completely ludicrous, but it's what they believed. Therefore, because the cross of Jesus was not their view of the gospel, neither was the cross of Jesus their view of the Christian life. So these beliefs that came from Christian science, having occult origins, that came into 
an apostate form of Pentecostalism led by William Branham and E.W. Kenyon became taken up by people like Kenneth Hagin and Kenneth Copeland. Later, Joyce Meyer, in more recent times, would say in her first book, unless you believe that Jesus went to hell, you can't go to heaven. Early Pentecostalism rejected these people solidly. The beliefs of Hagen uh, uh, and Copeland were not the beliefs of early Pentecostalism. Early Pentecostalism went off the rails at an early point, even after Azusa Street, but some people came along and, as it were, put grain into the poison stew. And they realized what were being taught by people like William Branham and E.W. Kenyon was not scriptural, and that much of what happened at Azusa Street was simply not biblical. However, in more recent years, what traditional and classical Pentecostalism rejected as apostate has become mainstream, the teachings of Kenneth K Copeland and Kenneth Hagin. On American television, Kenneth Copeland said he could have died for our sins because he's born again. Jesus went to hell and had to be born again in hell. Crazy. Because the cross of Jesus Christ is not their view of the gospel, neither is the cross of Jesus Christ their view of the Christian life. Instead of pick up your cross and follow me, instead of cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it one day for a crown, it becomes, you're a king's kid, blab it and grab it. Believe God for that Mercedes Benz. Believe God for that Cadillac. Name it and claim it. Consumerism comes to church. This is not the cross. This is not revival. For there to be a revival, the altar has to be rebuilt. Few things will tell us more about the real beliefs of the church at any time in history than the hymns it sings. Hymnody reveals the theology of a church at any given time. If you were to look at hymns that came from real revivals, such as the hymns of Charles Wesley or Isaac Watts, you'll find the hymns of Augustus Toplady similarly. Rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. As I'll cling to the old rugged cross, it's onward Christian soldier marching as to war with the cross of Jesus by Sir Arthur Sullivan after he became a Christian from Gilbert and Sullivan. Or it was, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? It was about blood atonement. It was about the cross, about the altar. It was by the cross, by the cross, where I first saw the light. Now, I'm not talking about styles of music. I'm talking about the lyrics, the words. Go through Hillsong or the Vineyard Hy Hymn Book and find out how little comparatively little focus there is on the cross and the blood. It's great south land. What's now is the time for us to march upon the land as Graham Kendrick or something of that nature. It's not what you see when there was moves of God. One of the ways people, particularly young people, get sucked into false doctrine today, such as post-millennialism and other inventions, is they sing choruses mindlessly. This is exactly what happens in the Hindu mantra. They empty themselves, trying to open themselves to a spiritual influence, which they vainly imagine to be the Holy Spirit, and they begin repeating something mindlessly. The Om <laughs> becomes their mantra. Well, they sing these choruses, but they have no idea what they're singing is not biblical. No idea. Come Holy Spirit, let your fire fall. Come Holy Spirit. It's not the Holy Spirit. It's not biblical. It's not the Holy Spirit. It's not biblical worship. It's a mantra. It is effectively Hinduism. People get absorbed into the theology via mindlessly singing hymns repetitively as you would in a Hindu mantra. It is a combination of spiritual seduction and hypnotic induction. Psychology and New Age religious philosophy. Masquerading is biblically Christian, but it's not biblical and it's not Christian. The altar must be restored. There must be a radical return to the centrality of the cross and the themes of the cross and the blood. That's what happens in a real revival. Now we see what transpires here. When that happens, many defect to him from not only Ephraim, but Manasseh, Simeon. People from the northern tribes come south to the throne of David and the house of David to where the ark of the Lord was in Jerusalem. When there's a real move of God, people will leave the bad churches for the good ones. 
We have made an idol out of unity, but it's not the unity of the Spirit. <coughs> the idol we've made out of unity is not the unity of the Spirit. It is a man-made unity. The unity of the Spirit depends on truth. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. And once in America at a conference had a very silly woman telling me we shouldn't worry about the doctrines of other Christians because Jesus prayed we should be one. Therefore, you throw truth out the window for the sake of unity. It's not biblical. If you would read that prayer in context, you would see that Jesus prayed, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. Unity of the Spirit depends on truth. You cannot have unity of the Spirit based on doctrinal error, false doctrine heresy, another gospel. Division is necessary. And a revival, splits are essential. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 19, there must be factions among you to prove which is true. That word for faction is heresies in Greek. There must be a split. Romans 16, 17, mark a factious man who depart from the tradition you've received. But the tradition we've received is the apostles' teaching. When people deviate from the New Testament, they're the ones who are factious, not the ones who remain loyal to the Bible. For revival to come, people must weep before they laugh, they must tear down before they build, they must command and not invite, they must return radically to the cross, but they also must divide, split. The early Jewish Christians, the Messianic Jews, would not compromise the truth of the Messiahship of Yeshua, of Jesus. They were forced out of the synagogue and the temple. The early Methodists were forced out of the Church of England. Luther, for all of his faults, when he had plenty and he got a lot wrong. But he did not begin trying to begin another religion. He began by trying to reform the Roman Church from within, as Erasmus did, and failed. Of course, Jeremiah 51 tells us why Babylon cannot be healed, however, he was forced out. The Reformation was a split. The day of Pentecost heralded a split. A split. Division is necessary for there to be a revival. Good Christians should leave backslidden churches. Good churches should leave backslidden denominations. How can you remain part of a denomination that will ordain homosexuals like the Uniting Church or the Methodists or the Presbyterians? How can you remain part of a denomination that will get in bed with Roman Catholicism? How can you do that? Good Christians need to leave bad churches and take as many with them as they can. Good pastors need to lead their congregations out of these corrupted institutions. People need to leave Ephraim, Simeon, and Manasseh and come to Judah and Benjamin. In a revival, not only will people be saved, but people will leave bad churches for good ones. They will leave backslidden denominations and institutional religions for where God really is, for where there's holiness. We must have a split. We must have a division. Revival depends not on an artificial unity, but a unity of the Spirit. And where is that unity of the Spirit? Where it's real and genuine, there will be a division. There must be a split. In order for revival to come, there must be a dividing. Asa understood that. The people made an oath and they blew the trumpets. This imagery to any Jew harkens back to the story of Jericho when they first entered the land, when they first began as a nation to conquer, their beginnings under Joshua, when they blew the trumpets and gave the great shout and the walls came down. In a revival, you always go back to your origins. Our origins are not Jericho, but our origins are the Book of Acts, a radical return to apostolic models of ecclesiology. Not so much in terms of a program, but in terms of principles. We need to go back to the book of Acts and do so radically. You cannot leave unbiblical practices in place. We have to go back to our true heritage of the apostolic church. This also, King Asa understood. This man never got anything wrong. Good to better, better to better still, and then unbelievably good. 
Let's look what happens in verse 16. He also removed Maaka, the mother of King Asa, from position of queen mother, because she had made a horrid image as an Asherah. And Asa cut down her horrid image, crushed it and burned it in the brook of Kidron. Actually, she was not his mother, but his grandmother. No nepotism, no family loyalties. As Jesus said, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. I love my Catholic mother, but my Catholic mother at this moment is on her way to hell. She's battled cancer. She's getting older. Yet she trusts in a statue of Mary and in a scapula for her salvation instead of in the blood of Jesus Christ. She believes in idolatry, superstition, necromancy. There's a cemetery in Donegal, Ireland where there's generations of my mother's family buried. Every time I drive past it, I speak at a local congregation there of, of born-again believers, mainly ex-Catholics. And when I go past that cemetery, that graveyard, I just think, how many of my forebearers are in hell because they trusted in sacraments instead of in the blood of Christ that cleanses from all sin, believing in a purgatory that doesn't even exist where they would atone for their own. Get rid of the image, the Harvard image. Get rid of that Madonna. That's not Miriam. That's Ashtaroth. The Madonna with the baby, that is Semiramis. That is Tammuz, against whom the prophet Ezekiel contended. No family loyalties would stand in the way. Oh, my, well, my mother loves the Lord, but she just loves her rosary. Every time she prays to the dead, she's committing the sin of necromancy. If you love your mother, tell her the truth. Oh, but she just loves her statue of St. Jude. You shall not make a graven image of anything in heaven above or earth beneath. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. That is idolatry. The Hebrew word for to bow down to a graven image is the same as the word to worship. Infinitive lehishtachavot. The Roman Catholic Church actually deleted that commandment from the Ten Commandments for centuries to justify their idolatry. Family royalties. Oh, I know that church in Toronto was wrong, but my children like the youth group. At least they're going there instead of to a discotheque. Oh, but my wife likes that place. I know it's crazy. Well, who did God call to be the spiritual head of the family? The wife or the husband? The father or the children? King Asa understood. In a real move of God, there could be no compromise. God comes first. If you love your family, you bring them into God's way of doing things. You don't tolerate that which is abhorrent to him. Like rosary beads and scapulas and medallions. These things are fetishism. They're superstition. They're idolatrous. Find them in the Bible, except where they're condemned. The story continues. Verse 17. But the high places were not removed from Israel. When someone begins to go off... It's never in a big way. It begins with a little fox, a little jackal. He slightly compromises. Now, he did take all the high places out of Israel in the beginning. And he did remove them from Judah and Benjamin. Only as the revival spread, in his desire to see the revival spread, he didn't remove all of them from Israel. In other words, well, in my church, we're not going to have any of this. But in order to get these others into the revival, we're going to turn a blind eye to things which aren't biblical. A slight compromise. It was his first mistake. Not a big one, but eventually it would become a big one. Its repercussions would lead the north back into idolatry. But we read the following. Nevertheless, Asa's heart was blameless all his days. He was always good. He brought into the house of God the dedicated things of his father and his own dedicated things, 
silver and gold utensils, and there was no more war until the 35th year of Asa's reign. He goes into his own pocket and gives his sword. There are three things that will bring down a man of God. Characteristically, there are three things. Sexual immorality, love of money, spiritual pride. Sexual immorality, love of money, spiritual pride. Unless, of course, he's a minister in the Elam denomination, in which case he might hit the jackpot. <laughs> Fooling around with women, that wasn't his thing. A man in the family, going back to Solomon, messing around with broads, he wasn't into that. He didn't do that. That wasn't his thing. He wasn't a womanizer. Love of money, he didn't prostitute the word of God. He didn't use his position as a leader to line his own pockets. He didn't do that. Rather, he went into his own pocket and gave to the Lord. His weakness was not women. His weakness was not love of money. That leaves the big one. The pride that cometh before the fall. In the 36th year of Asa's reign, Baasha, king of Israel, came up against Judah and fortified Ramah in order to prevent anyone from going out or coming into Asa, king of Judah. Remember, people were defecting to him. The kings of Israel in the north were so desperate to keep the people and the numbers and the wealth that they, going back to Jeroboam, they put golden calves at Dan and in Bethel at the northern and southern extremities of Israel. So people would hearken back to the sin of, of Aaron, worshiping the golden calves in the Sinai and in the, in the desert, rather than go to Jerusalem for the pilgrim feasts. But people began defecting. There's a real revival there. God is with him. They're losing numbers. The only thing they cared about was the thing that people care about today, numbers and money. I know plenty of ministers, plenty of preachers in the Assemblies of God and Elam and the Baptists, Anglican vicars, they knew, for instance, the laughing and drunken revival was a counterfeit. They knew it wasn't biblical. But the church up the street had it. And if they don't have it, they're going to lose customers. This becomes the mentality. The pastor becomes not a shepherd, but a manager. Ministry becomes marketing. They're no longer running a congregation. They're running an enterprise. We're losing numbers. We've got to do something. So he fortifies Ramah, an elevated point overlooking Jerusalem from the north slightly to the northwest. And he's there, and the siege begins. But look what happens. Verse 2, Then Asa bought out silver and gold from the treasuries of the house of the Lord and the king's house, and sent them to Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, who lived in Damascus, saying, let there be a treaty between you and me as between my father and your father. Behold, I have sent you silver and gold. Go, break your treaty with Basha, king of Israel, so that he will withdraw from me. So ben listened to King Asa and sent the commanders of his armies against the cities of Israel. And they conquered Ijon and Dan and abel Maim, which means the waters of mourning, and all the store cities of Naphtali. And when Baasha heard of it, he ceased fortifying Ramah and stopped his work. Then King Asa bought all Judah, and they carried away the stones of Ramah and its timber with which Baasha had been building. And with them he fortified Geba and Mitzpah. He made what seemed to be a good management decision. And he even profited from the opposition. It would seem, initially, as if the opposition again became opportunity. Once more, it was the backslider who was his most serious threat for the second time. This time it was his Jewish brothers, not just monotheistic Gentiles. Now when he was up against the Ethiopian, what does he do? Oh, Lord God, we have nobody but you. He had no money. 
He had no power. He had no great strength. Now he's loaded. He has tremendous wealth. He has very significant amount of military power. He's strong and he's rich. Is something wrong with prosperity or with power? No. Is there something wrong with us? Yes, the old nature. These things are natural grounds for pride and self-sufficiency. When he had nothing, oh God, we have no one but you. Now he's wealthy and powerful. Get me that king up in Damascus on the telephone. Hello. How much is that worthless cousin of mine paying you? I'll double it. You take Visa? He attempts to buy him off. He makes what initially appears to be a good management decision because it works. The siege is lifted. And he takes the booty and he uses it to fortify Mitzpah. And he uses it to fortify Giba. Well, I bought him off. That's it. We're doing good. So he thought. What happens next? At that time, Hanani the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because you have relied on the king of Aram and have not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Aram has escaped out of your hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubim an immense army with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. You have acted foolishly in this. Indeed, from now on, you will surely have wars. He thought he made a good management decision. It is shocking today how many evangelical Bible colleges and seminaries are teaching pastors to be managers. This is not to suggest we don't have things to learn from secular disciplines, but they must always be subordinated to the principles of Scripture. And we see God is looking to and fro upon the earth that he may strongly support those who are his. We're told that God knows what we need before we even ask him. It's a very assuring thing for a believer to know that God is looking to help us. <laughs> Who can I help? Who can I help? I'm looking for someone to help. God is looking to help us before we even know we need the help. One condition. Our hearts must be truly His. There's a problem here. It's like if you pay a blackmailer. He'll always be back for more because he knows he can get it. Don't you see that God not only wanted to give you victory over the king of Israel, but over the king of Aram, God wanted to give you all of it? He wanted to give you that guy? He wanted to give you that booty as well from Aram? God wanted you to have all of it. Now you've blown it. You're going to have wars from now on. You relied on your wealth and power. You relied on the blessing instead of the one who blesses. You rely on the gift instead of the giver. You got a problem. The problem was not the wealth or the power. The problem was pride. Self-sufficiency. Look how he responds. Verse 10, Then Asa was angry with the seer and put him in prison. For he was enraged at him for this. And Asa oppressed some of the people at the same time. Who are you to tell me I'm King Asa? I defeated the Ethiopian. I lifted the siege. I built up Mitzvah and Giba. I'm the one who brought revival. Who are you to tell me? And then he oppresses the people. What comes next? Heavy shepherding. Ezekiel 34 type stuff. Who are you to question me? Then he oppresses the people. I'm on a higher plane than you are. Heavy shepherding comes next. Oppressing the people. 
fleecing the sheep? What a tragedy. It wasn't immorality, it wasn't money. It was something that's even potentially more deadly than the love of money or the lust of the flesh. And he oppresses the people at the same time. Now, it wasn't that he used the wealth and the power. He relied on it. There's a difference. Verse 11, now the acts of Asa from the last to the first, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. When the Holy Spirit gives us more than one account of something, it's important. We have not only the account in Kings, we have the account in Chronicles. Kings is more of a biographical approach. Chronicles is more of a historical approach. But when the Holy Spirit gives us more than one account of something, it's important, like the four Gospels. In the 39th year of his reign, Asa became diseased in his feet. His disease was severe, yet even in his disease he did not seek the Lord but the physicians. We do not suggest that all illness is a direct result of a specific sin. Illness came into the world as death did because of sin in general, the homodesty or the fall of man. But not all sin is caused, uh, all illness is caused by a specific sin. In John chapter 9, Jesus was asked, who sinned, this young man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus said it was neither him or his parents. We cannot conclude from the scripture by any means that every illness is caused by a specific sin. But in this case, it was. In John chapter 5, Jesus told the paralytic, go your way and sin no more, let nothing worse than may befall you. In that case, it was. In James chapter 5, we're told that illness can be caused by a sin. Sin can cause illness in James 5. In Psalm 32, when I remained silent about my sin, my body wasted away. The Psalms tell us that sin can cause illness. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul tells us those who defile the Lord's table take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, can become physically ill and even die prematurely. Yes, sin can cause illness, but not all illness is a result of a specific sin. But in this case, it was. God was trying to get his attention. But what does he do? He picks up the telephone, I'm the king, get me the best podiatrist, get me the best chiropodist. Get me the best professor of medical science specializing in maladies of the feet. Call Harley Street in London. Call a professor at the top university. Call Harvard Medical School. I want the top guy. I'm the king. He relies on positions. He relies on wealth. He relies on power. Not that God can't use these things, but we rely on the Lord. Never take an aspirin without praying. Whenever you get involved with the world's health system, its financial system, its legal system, its government, its education system, whenever you get involved with the world, never rely on it and have God's wisdom before you go to it. He didn't do that. He did not seek the Lord but the physicians. You call the physicians, but you first seek the Lord. You might use the blessings, but you first seek the one who blesses. We might use temporal things under God's guidance and direction, but we never rely on them. He did. Now he had them. When he didn't have them, he only trusted God. Again, his problem was pride. Whatever was wrong with his feet, it was something serious. We're told it was severe. It was not simply this hydrogenous dermatitis or athlete's foot. Probably not even gout. It may have been something symptomatic of diabetes, elephantitis. We don't know, but it had the potential to kill him. So Asa slept with his fathers, having died in the 41st year of his reign. Who knows how many more years he might have had. They buried him in his own tomb, which he'd cut out for himself in the city of David. And they laid him in the resting place, which he had filled with spices of various kinds blended by the perfumer's art. You can embalm a corpse nice and pretty, but it's still dead. And they made a very great fire for him. 
He had a big funeral. They always give them a big send-off. He had a big funeral, like Sir Winston Churchill, like JFK and Princess Diana. But as it says in Ecclesiastes, they're just as dead as somebody who was buried in a potter's field. It didn't have to end this way. He had so much right for so long. His problem was not how to bring revival. His problem was how to handle it once it happened. We have much to learn from King Asa. We have things to learn about what not to do. But we have more to learn about what we should do. Now, of course, the obvious caveat is, if he could make this kind of mistake, who's immune? If a man of God like him, who had so much right for so long, who God blessed and used so much, who understood so much about revival, about reform, about restoration, if someone like him could fall into spiritual pride and cut short the blessings and purpose of God in his life, who's immune? I'm certainly not. If he can fall into this, I can, so can you. Yes, we have to learn from his mistakes. But we certainly have to learn from his victories, from his wisdom, from his faithfulness. He understood the basic things people don't understand today. He knew the things that people don't want to know today. Remember, he was not chasing money. Today, many of the people trying to promote revival are chasing money. So their motive is wrong to begin with. Mel Gibson said, I'm a hell of a lot richer than I used to be. I don't have to answer these questions anymore. He admitted in an interview it was about money. No wonder it didn't bring revival. He said, you don't have to believe in Jesus to be saved. Yet silly evangelicals will follow that film using it as an evangelistic tool that doesn't work because it can't. It wasn't about money. It wasn't his thing. It wasn't the woman, Isaac. He was a moral man. He wasn't an Ian Bilby. A serial adulterer telling people there was a revival when he was fooling around with women with his worship leader. He wasn't a Roberts Lyardon preaching about revival when he was a homosexual in bed with his youth minister. He was different. He was real. He was genuine. He was sincere. He wanted to see revival come. He knew that it has to come by tearing down before you build up. He knew you use the good times to prepare for the bad so they won't be bad for you. He knew you have to go back to your heritage radically. He knew you couldn't remain static. You have to become more and more radical. The revival must continue. He knew people had to defect and leave the bad for the good, the false for the true. He knew it's difficult to get to the top, but easy to fall off the top down to the bottom once you get there. He knew a lot of things. He knew not to compromise even with family. He knew to tear down the high places that unbiblical worship would lead to idolatry. He knew. He knew so much. He went from good to better and better to better still. He knew that God commands men to repent. He doesn't invite. He's a king. May God give us leaders, preachers, revivalists in the character of King Asa today. Men who are moral, not immoral. Men who are not lovers of money. Men who are lovers of God, who are committed, who won't compromise, who understand God's principles, God's ways. They know man's ways don't work. They know a promise keeper can't work. An alpha course can't work. A Toronto or a Pensacola can't work. A purpose driven can't work. They know it doesn't work. They know what does. This does. This is what works. There is no program for revival, but there are principles, God's principles. King Asa not only knew those principles intellectually, but he believed them in his heart, and he lived them out in his life. 
He wanted a revival. So do I. And if you love Jesus, if you love the lost, if you love your nation, your country, you want revival too. If it's going to come, it's not going to come from the flavor of the month, from the latest fad to make the program. It's not going to come from the Toronto, the Pensacola, or the Kansas City. It will not come from the promise keepers or the gold teeth. It will not come from the purpose-driven or the God-chasing. It will come from this. That's what Asa knew. That's what I know. And that's what the same God wants you to know. God bless and thank you. My name is Jacob Prash. May the Lord be with you. In Jesus' name, amen.